Okay, just going through the examples on page 11 to 20 here. So orange light and green light are both shot on a metal. One color causes the photoelectric effect and the other does not. Which is which? Okay, let's think about this. Sorry, Indigo. Um, okay, so what is the relationship between these things in terms of we can do wavelength or we can do frequency? Okay, again, I think of it as big, long wavelengths, low energy, right? That's a low energy chilled out wave. This guy's manic, right? That's a high energy wave. Low wavelength, high energy. Long wavelength, low energy. But that just means for frequency, right? That was a high frequency wave, high energy wave, low frequency wave, low energy wave. So for these guys, we know that red has the shortest wavelength, right? Or we could think of it the other way around, that frequency increases. Either way, energy increases this way. And again, the frequency, we can think of the threshold frequency, right? So we need to overcome the threshold frequency for the photoelectric effect to happen. If one of these things didn't and one of the other things did, well, that means the threshold frequency is somewhere between their two frequencies, right? If one passed the test and the other didn't, well, then the pass line is right in the middle of the two. So what are we comparing? We're comparing orange and green. So which one has a higher frequency? Green, right? So that means the threshold frequency is somewhere between orange and green. Green passes, orange doesn't, because green has a high enough threshold frequency. So green. Numerically, we could say that frequency of orange light is less than the threshold frequency, right? Obviously, because it didn't cause the photoelectric effect. We could also say the, the threshold frequency is less than the frequency of green light because green light did cause it. Green light had a high enough frequency and therefore a high enough energy to boot out an electron. Okay, blue light, 420 nanometers, is incident upon a metal with a threshold energy, okay, of 2.01 electron volts. So that is the work function. With what speed would the electron be emitted? Right away, we're going to be needed to use Planck's constant. Let's go ahead and convert this to joules. Okay, just multiplying by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules per electron volt. So, conservation of energy. The energy incoming in the photon is going to be equal to, well, where does that go? When the photon gets completely destroyed, all its energy gets used up, and some of it was to go to the work function. The rest of it will go to the kinetic energy of the electron. So what's the energy of any photon? It's, well, we were given wavelength, so let's use this version. The work function, we were given the work function, so we don't need to put in our expression for that. And we want the speed. So I could sub this in. I'm just going to go ahead and find the kinetic energy first. Nothing wrong with subbing in mv squared over 2 right now and then directly solving for v. Let's just find the kinetic energy first, though, and then we can go back and get the speed with that after. We'll just keep sig digs as we go. So what is the kinetic energy? Okay, just subbing in there. I got that it is. You'll probably notice I'm keeping a few more sig digs than I usually do. We're kind of getting now into the world of very small numbers sometimes. So as a precaution, I like to keep quite a few sig digs, okay? Because I don't want those little small rounding to come back at all later. Usually about four decimal places is safe. It can get a little dodgy here with the numbers we're going to be dealing with. They are incredibly tiny sometimes. Kinetic energy of any particle with mass and some speed is mass times that speed squared divided by two. Therefore, the speed is the square root of 2ek over m. We just found ek. And don't forget, we're dealing with an electron here. Often we'll be dealing with an electron. Don't always assume we are, though, okay? But with the photoelectric effect, yeah, we pretty much always are. Now, I got that this thing would be able to move at 578,000 meters per second. Okay, this is a good one. It's getting you to really think about what you're doing. So if you're watching this examples video, okay, I really recommend pause here, think about it, try to come up with your own description for this. And then if you really are struggling, come back, you can see what I put and how I say it. But I suggest you really do this one on your own, try it out. So if a photon with a frequency of that many Hertz is incident upon a metal with some work function, it wants us to know how would we determine the energy of the ejected electron. So this is 
getting you to model the thought process, right? Well, we know total energy will be conserved. So we'll think about the energies before and the energies after. So the energy incoming, right? The energy before is the energy of the photon. How are we going to get it? With Planck's formula. And we were given a frequency, so we'll use this version. We won't use the wave-like version. Okay, so now we've got the incoming energy. We know that total energy is going to be conserved. So how do we figure out how much energy goes to the ejected electron? Well, where is any other energy going to go? It's going to go into removing the electron, right? So that's what we'll do next. We'll figure out how much energy needs to go into dealing with this, this work function. Right, because some photon energy goes into that. Finally, the leftovers, right? The leftover energy will just be, it can't have disappeared, law of conservation of energy. So where did it go? Into the energy of the electron. All right, now if we've done all that, how do you get the speed of the electron? All right, now if we've done all that, how do you get the speed of the electron? So. This is really a science 10 question, honestly, right? I could give a science 10 question, the energy of electron and the mass of an electron, and they should be able to find the speed of it in theory, which is what you've already done for them. So, so we find it by taking the kinetic energy equation, which has V in it and solve it for V. Okay, nothing too fancy there. All right. So a photon with a frequency equal to two and a half times the threshold frequency. Ooh, okay. So frequency of the photon is equal to 2.5 threshold frequency. It's incident upon a metal with a work function of 3.1 electron volts. Calculate the speed at which the electron would be ejected. Okay, so definitely going to have to convert this to joules because I'm going to have to use it in my kinetic energy formula, which does not work with electron volts. It does, it just doesn't work with electron volts and kilograms and, and meters per second, which is the other things we're gonna have to plug in. So it kind of doesn't. Okay, so we begin with the conservation of energy. So the energy incoming in the photon is gonna be equal to whatever goes into overcoming the work function and then whatever's left over can belong to the electron in the form of kinetic. So the energy in, the energy of any photon is Planck's constant times the frequency. The work function is Planck's constant times the threshold frequency. And this time I'm again, I'm just gonna find EK first and then we'll go to solving for V. Okay, so nothing new there. The kinetic energy is equal to the energy of the photon HF minus the work function H times the threshold frequency. But remember, the, in this case, the photon's frequency is two and a half times the threshold frequency. So we have so just kind of rearranging that a little bit, right? We have two and a half HF naughts minus one HF naught. So kinetic energy is equal to one and a half HF naughts. By the way, you could have done this with theory at the beginning. It's got two and a half times the threshold frequency. It has two and a half times the work function of energy, right? If it has two and a half times the work function of energy, how many work functions does it have to overcome? Just one. So take two and a half work functions and subtract one and you're left with one and a half work functions, right? We could, could have kind of reasoned our way there at the beginning, but we showed it mathematically as well. Okay, so weirdly enough, we're gonna go back to calling HF naught. Remember, that's just the work function, right? Why are we doing that? Because we were given the work function. We were given the threshold frequency. So we'll plug that number in. And we get that the kinetic energy is 7.4. Okay, I know that looks rounded, but it's actually not. All right. And there we go. We've got our kinetic energy. What do we want? We want the speed of the electron. So with the kinetic energy and the mass of an electron that we always have, that's no problem. And I got that that electron must be going at 1.28 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. About 1.3 million meters per second. Fast. All right, so a violet photon is shot on a metal. The electrons are ejected with a speed of 1.5 times 10 to the five meters per second. Okay, so again, this is one. You're gonna get the most out of this, well, any question really by trying it on your own. But see if you can kind of go through the reasoning, the physics ideas and the math reasoning to how you would solve this. And then come back if you want and see what I said.
So this time we are given the speed of the electrons, right? So this time we are going to be able to figure out the kinetic energy of the electrons. We also know about the photons wavelength so we can find their energy and it's asking us to find the work function, right? So essentially look at the energy of the photon, look at the energy of the electron and say, what's missing? And what's missing went into overcoming the work function. So, right, find the kinetic energy that electron has using that speed. Right, now find the energy that the photon came in with using Planck's formula, but we'll use the wavelength version because we are given a wavelength. Okay, and what's our answer? Well, whatever's missing, right? Whatever's missing must have gone into the work function. Okay, now it says do it for real. So the energy incoming in the photon is equal to the work function of the material, the work needed to done to free the electron, and if any left over, the electron's kinetic energy. So we're looking for the work function. So hey, just like we said, right? Subtract the kinetic energy from the energy coming in. Good to be thinking about it though, and not just being robots. Now, what is the energy of the photon? Well, it's HC over lambda minus the kinetic energy of the electron will be its mass times its speed squared over two. And look at that, we're ready to plug in. Hey, big long thing to type in your calculator. You might want to break it up a bit, but if you do it carefully, or hopefully, unless I didn't do it carefully, but I got 5.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So pop quiz, what is that energy? Physically, what does that represent? What happened here? What is that energy for? Okay, that is the amount of energy the photon had to use up just to free the electron, right? The definition of the work function. Okay, if UV light was used instead of the violet, what would be the effect? Okay, let's stop right there. If UV light was used instead of the violet, what's that really changing? What's that really changing? I always go to wavelengths. I'm not sure why. My brain just works that way. I go to wavelengths, so I'll just start there. Uh, lambda UV, UV is a shorter wavelength, right? It's less than lambda violet. Okay, so what are we doing here? We are decreasing lambda. If we want, we could say we are also increasing the frequency, okay? Let's take a look at these now. Incoming energy, what would that do? Increase, at decrease, or stay the same? Well, E equals, let's use frequency since we have it there, right? If we increase the frequency, we increase the energy. With our other equation, it still works. If we decrease the denominator, now we're dividing by a smaller number. So either way, our answer is that we are increasing energy, incoming energy anyway. What would happen to the work function? Did we change this metal that we were using? The surface that the light was incident on? No, right? The work function is an inherent property of it. It's how hard it is to kick out electrons. It has nothing to do with what you're doing to kick it out, right? Grade six is the same content, whether you're in kindergarten or in grade 12, it's just grade six would be really easy for a grade 12 and really hard for a kindergartner, right? Same idea here. The work function doesn't change, it just might be encountered with light that has an easier time overcoming it than other light. And what would switching to UV do to the speed of the ejected electron? Well, we just said it has more incoming energy, right? If it has more incoming energy and the work function is staying the same, the same amount is getting used up, well, that means it has more leftovers. And where do the leftovers go? To the electron as kinetic energy. So if it comes in with more energy, you better believe that ejected electron is gonna have more energy as well. Right, and we could kind of mathematically justify this as well. We said we're gonna decrease the wavelength, therefore increase the energy, right? If we decrease this, we're getting a bigger number here and therefore that's gonna be increased too. So pretty straightforward in terms of uh, stopping potential ones. It's just giving us the stopping potential and asking us to find what the EK max must be, right? So. Again, the stopping voltage is what voltage do you need to apply, what potential difference you need to apply to take away the energy of the most energetic electrons that get ejected by this photon, right? So in other words, the most efficiently excited electrons by the photon. All of them do receive the same amount of kinetic energy again, right? But remember, some of them lose some on their way getting bounced out. They take a funny path and they end up losing some energy, okay? So if we can find the stopping voltage at which even the 
fastest electrons get stopped, then we really found the kinetic energy that this photon goes into transferring to the electron. The kinetic energy max is equal to QV stop, which this QV stop is just a change in energy by this guy from unit two. So the change in energy as in the energy we need to take away from the most energetic ones. So maybe a little more of a complex idea to wrap your head around, but a very straightforward calculation. Since potential difference means how many joules for every coulomb, it makes sense that we're just gonna multiply the coulombs by the joules per coulomb to get the number of joules this will take, okay? Or if you wanna do it in electron volts, it would be three volts times the charge of one electron. So it would be three electron volts because by definition, one electron volt is the energy it would take to accelerate an electron through a potential difference of one volt. So to move it through three volts would take three electron volts. So a light source of 548 nanometers, that's the wavelength, is shot on a photocell with a work function of 1.6 electron volts. Okay, just gonna convert that right away. How many photocells would be required to have an output voltage of 12 volts? Okay, this is pretty cool. This is how solar energy works. So essentially the sun comes in, so essentially a photon comes in from the sun, right? It causes an electron to be released. It causes photo current to happen, right? It beats the work function. And then we can kind of harness that electron's energy, right? So it's the same idea here. So a little bit weird way of thinking about the stopping voltage, but it does apply here too as well. E in, because the kinetic energy plus the work function. So here, like the voltage is not stopping the electron. However, it's still saying what voltage would you need to stop it? So we are still talking about the energy of the electron, right? No, it's not physically being stopped but that doesn't change the fact that you would need this voltage to stop it. And so the output voltage is just a way of thinking about the energy of that electron indirectly. Okay, so E in is the energy of the photon equal to Q times the voltage we would need to stop the electron plus the work function. Now, if we wanna know how many photocells we need to have 12 volts, let's first figure out what one photocell will do here. So one photocell can accept one photon. So when you see a solar panel, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of photocells. So just moving stuff around. One photocell is going to have an output voltage of whatever this equals. Okay, and I got that V stop as 0 0.66848 volts. Okay, so that is for one photo cell, okay? We wanna know how many of them will give us 12 volts total. So we know that V total equals 12 volts and the total voltage is just the voltage of one cell times the number of cells, right? So the number of cells take the total and divide it by how many one can provide, how much one can provide. And I got that you would need 17.9, but that means 18 cells. Even if it was supposed to be rounded down to 17, right? You need to round up, because if you round down, then you don't have enough cells to provide, right? Okay, we're gonna jump into a bit here now of graphical analysis of this stuff. Okay, so usually the manipulated variable is frequency, and usually the responding variable is stopping voltage, okay? So let's consider for a sec the possible significance of slope. Now. This is an equation that guys, y equals mx plus b form makes life a lot easier here, okay? So I'm just gonna say, let's start with our equation, okay? As you always should for graphical analysis, start with the equation. E in is equal to the kinetic energy plus the work function. Now we need to get v stop and the frequency in there. So the energy of the photon, right? Kinetic energy is equivalent to the stopping voltage times the charge that it has to stop. And the work function is just the work function, although it could be H times the threshold frequency if we need it to be. Okay, so now we have our Y and our X in the equation. Let's put it into Y equals MX plus B form and see what we see. Okay, we're almost there. We have Q times Y. Let's get actually just Y. Okay, I just divided both sides by Q. Aha, okay, now notice this is y, our y variable, v stop is on the y axis. Where's our x variable? Well, it's right there. There's x, okay? 
So when you look at this, notice, whoops, that should be a minus, sorry. Okay, so our Y is there and our X is there. Is it starting to look like something to you, right? There's M, our slope. And that means this thing is B, the Y intercept. So in some cases, it's, it is beneficial to just kind of mess around with trying dividing them or uh, seeing what you get to see if you can look at it. But a lot of the times, guys, for these straight line equations, Y equals MX plus B is your friend. I do find students a little bit afraid of it. It is a lot easier to do it this way than to mess around with it until uh, inspiration hits, okay? You could also do the unit analysis here. You could say, okay, I have voltage. That's joules per coulomb, right? If I were to look at the slope first, just because why not, divided by uh, frequency in hertz, so seconds to the minus one. Okay, so that would be joules. One over one over seconds is joules seconds per coulomb. And aha, you might arrive at the same conclusion, but look at this, right? Look how nice that is. What is the slope? The slope is Planck's constant divided by charge. Okay, now for the area here, we, have to, we do kind of have to say, okay, if I multiply V stop by frequency, do I get anything? Do I get anything out of this equation by multiplying V stop by frequency? Well, no, right? V stop by frequency is going to be a mess. It's going to be H F squared over Q minus W F over Q. It doesn't really help us too much, right? We could also look at the units. If I have joules per coulomb times one over seconds, I have joules per coulomb second, um, which I guess you could interpret as the power per unit charge. Um, but realistically, not much for us here, right? Okay, what about the x-intercept? What does that tell us? More and more inter intercepts are gonna start being important. I know they didn't pop up much in physics 20. They do a lot more in physics 30, okay? X-intercept, so what is this point? Well, it is the point at which the stopping voltage first has to do something, right? Where the stopping voltage first must be stopping electrons. Hey, in other words, it's the first time that electrons get kicked out. What do we call that? What frequency are we at when the electrons first get kicked out? We are at the threshold frequency, okay? Now, what about the y-intercept? And I know you can't see it, but you could extend it, okay? Interpret the y-intercept. That is, right, you could do that. Yes, it's gonna be negative, Okay, so we can put it there. But from the y equals mx plus b, our y-intercept is clearly negative work function over the charge. So we could, just from the y equals mx plus b form, get that. Nothing wrong with that. It is easy. It is quick. But also, let's think about it, right? This is the quote-unquote voltage, right, when the frequency is zero. In other words, it's kind of like this negative part here. It is almost sort of this, it's like a negative voltage that we need to overcome to even get the electron to move at all, right? It's a little easier to think about when we think about it in terms of energy. So here comes that. Okay, so sometimes the kinetic energy max of the electron's already been calculated for you and it's already been plotted. So check carefully, okay? These are, it's just basically taken the vo stopping voltage and multiplied it by Q for you. They are a little bit easier to work with, okay? But ideas are no different. We have, Okay, so to put it into y equals mx plus b form, we first have to have y and x both appear. Y does already appear, so we're good, but x, the frequency, is nowhere to be found. Ah, right, because this energy in is really Planck's constant times the frequency. Okay, so now we can put it in y equals mx plus b form by putting y where y should be and x where x should be. So y equals, right, and my x is now there. So looky, looky. Now, what's the slope? The slope straight up right away is just going to give me Planck's constant. I don't even need to multiply it by the charge once I have it. The area is, if you do the unit analysis, you will get joules times hertz, right? Area being y times x. So you'll get joules times hertz or joules times inverse seconds, which equals joules per second, which is a unit of power. But we kind of have to think physically about what we're interpreting here, right? We're talking about the kinetic energy of the electrons and the frequency of the photons. So it's not like we can really say these electrons have that frequency and so that we're actually meaningfully manipulating it. We can't really say it's the power of the photon either because remember, this EK max doesn't represent all of the photon's energy because a lot of the photon's energy went into the work function. So again, area kind of nothing here. At the very least, nothing you'll ever use in physics 30.
All right, the x-intercept. So again, what is this point, right? What is this thing? Well, notice it's the frequency below that frequency, no kinetic energy, so no electrons moving, right? And then boom, suddenly when we get above that frequency, there is, so we can interpret that with our physics. What does that mean? The x-intercept is threshold frequency. Okay, now the y-intercept, again, just from our y equals mx plus b, yes, the y-intercept is the negative work function. Negative work function, right? Okay, but let's look at the graph a bit. If we extend this down properly, okay, we can continue our line and notice, right, this would be some negative number. And we can think of that as, well, why is it negative? Because that energy, if we think of the electron sitting there, it not only does it have zero kinetic energy, it actually kind of has almost, if we're trying to get it to move, it's like there's a negative energy we're gonna to have to undo to even get it to move, which is kind of just the definition of the work function, right? Of course, it's not the work function, it's the negative work function because the work function is positive, right? So when we find it down there, make it positive when you actually call it the work function, okay? So just a kind of summary here. Looking at the graphs, think of them this way, okay? I really do suggest it. So. There's a few ways to go with it. You can have V stop equals HE over HE be the slope, X being the frequency, right? Depending on what you're given, depending on how you're looking at it, Y could be EK max, or you could make it QV stop, okay? So for an EK max, the slope is always Planck's constant. The X intercept is always the threshold frequency and the Y intercept is always the negative work function. Same thing up here. You'll just have to multiply the slope by Q and the Y intercept by Q. Since we're doing the photoelectric effect, Q is always the charge of an electron. All right, let's actually apply this. So again, I recommend try this on your own, but if you've tried it and you're pausing now to look and get some help maybe, okay, start with a line of best fit like always. So determine the value of Planck's constant using graphical analysis, okay. So how do we get that now? Well, start with the equation. Now we don't have our y and our x in there right now, right? V stop and frequency do not appear. Can we fix that? Well, yeah, we could say hf equals qv stop plus the work function. And there we go. Now h that we want, right? Frequency, that's our x and v stop is our y. Playing around with it a bit, we can get it in y equals mx plus b form. And there we go. So, to get Planck's constant, what do we have to do? We need to find the slope, right? So, and therefore Planck's constant is Q times the slope. So let's go ahead and get our slope. Nothing's changed here. Slopes always rise over run. Okay, those are some pretty good points. So my rise, six volts minus, be careful, negative two volts. So it rose eight volts, I ran. Be careful here too, right? Check your units, okay? 3.6 times 10 to the power of 15 hertz, not just 3.6 hertz, okay? That'd be very low, low frequency light. Okay, so if H equals Q times slope, then H equals Q times rise over run, which equals, we're still talking about an electron here. My rise was eight volts. Over run, two do times 10 to the power of 15 hertz. I got 6.4 times 10 to the negative 34. Uh, joule seconds are the units because we know we're looking for Planck's constant, but let's check it out, but not bad, right? 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 versus 6.4, that's pretty good. I feel pretty good about that answer, okay? Let's do a quick unit check, especially since we're just doing graphical analysis here. We haven't messed with an equation too much. Are coulombs times volts divided by hertz the same as joule seconds? So our Is that true? Let's see, as we know, a volt is a joule per coulomb. So we have, so there we go, coulombs cancel already. Divided by hertz, which is just an inverse second. So a joule divided by an inverse second is a joule second. Very good, it is equal to a joule second. Unit check, got our backs. Okay, now it asks us to determine the value of the work function the metal used and do it two different ways. So two different ways. Let's start with the way we had kind of already talked about. While the y-intercept, whoops, I forgot to divide this by q. 
<laughs> that would have been bad. Okay, the y-intercept is equal to the negative work function divided by the charge, right? So find the y-intercept, multiply it by the charge, and we should have the work function. So option one, using the y-int. Okay, so again, so the work function is equal to negative q times the y-intercept, which is equal to... And our y-intercept is negative 8.2557. Yes, negative 8.25 volts. So good that there's a negative there because now that negative will get canceled out. We got that the work function was 1.32 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, don't have much to compare it to, but the units are good, right? Coulombs times joules per coulomb. Coulombs will cancel, we'll have joules. Okay, so that looks good. That's the unit of work function. Let's try it another way. What's the other way this thing's even talking about? Well, at the x-intercept, at the x-intercept, what is that frequency again? The threshold frequency. Hey, what's the main way, what's the equation we have for threshold frequency? We do have an equation for it, right? So the other way we could do it is with the x-intercept. So sometimes this comes down to a preference and b which one's nicer you might have a really nice y-intercept you might not have such a great x-intercept or you might have forgotten to draw your graph to extend to the y-intercept like i've done before and you say okay well i'm using the x-intercept because i'm not redrawing this whole graph okay so the work function is equal to planck's constant times the threshold frequency and that as we know is the x-intercept and so the work is equal to h times the x-intercept it's actually even a little bit easier honestly Looking at the x-intercept, look like looks like about 2.1. And don't forget, 2.1 times 10 to the power of 15 hertz, right? So when I did that, I got 1.39 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, did it two ways, got very close answers, feeling good about that, okay? If you do it two ways and get something completely different, then hopefully you can figure out which one's wrong. And it's not both of them, hopefully. Okay, graphical analysis, huge topic on diplomas, okay? Especially with the photoelectric effect. All right, just kind of taking a step back now and thinking about the theory that goes in the photoelectric effect. So a student observes how changing the intensity of the radiation incident upon a metal affects the observed photoelectric current. The frequency of the incoming radiation is kept constant as a controlled variable, okay? Frequency of the incoming radiation is kept constant as a controlled variable. So. If the radiation incident on the metal has a frequency that is below F naught, which of the lines displays the observed current? So what do you think? If the frequency is below the threshold frequency, what does that mean for our experiment? Right, it means no electrons are ejected. So if there's no electrons being ejected, what kind of photo current are we gonna get? You betcha, none, right? So which of these lines matches? D. If and if no electrons are ejected, obviously no photo current. Okay, so you're actually, you're gonna see in the future when I go to answer number three, you're gonna see an answer here that I was not being very careful. So here's a lesson, okay? Be careful about what's on the x-axis. I was thinking this said frequency. So the answer you see in the future for this video for number two, just ignore it. Listen to the one I'm about to give you. Number one, I was fine. I was thinking correctly. For some reason, I changed my mind on number two, <laughs> okay? So we have current as a function of intensity, and it's asking why does line B not represent actual data? Well, let's think about this for a sec. What's the relationship between the photo current and the intensity? Remember, intensity is essentially just another way of saying how many photons you're sending. If the photons you're sending have a frequency above the threshold frequency, then you will get current, right? As long as your intensity is above zero, if you're sending even one photon, with a frequency above the threshold frequency, then that one photon will knock out one electron and you will have a little bit of photo current, right? So if B is claiming to be the graphed data for something that is producing the photoelectric effect, well then where should it start having a current? At which intensity? Would this intensity here, would there be, would there actually be no photo current all the way up to this intensity here? No, right? If even one photon has enough energy to do it, then an intensity of 0 0.0000001 watts per meter squared will produce a non-zero current. So A is correct. That's what it should look like. B should look like A. 
even just physically, you can't have a negative current, right? It's saying that if we had an intensity here, what would our current be? Negative. What? What does that mean? Right? So for that reason alone, right, can't have a negative current right away. B can't be real data. And then also, right, as long as you're sending photons with the at least the threshold frequency, then one photon will knock out one electron and there you go, you'll have current. So the only place where if you're meeting the threshold frequency, you'll actually have zero photo current is at zero. So that should be the X intercept of the B. It should look like A. Okay, line C, ooh, line C does also not represent actual data, explain. So think about line C. What's increasing here, the intensity, and it's saying that there's been some photo current. So according to them, the threshold frequency has been met. There's a photo current, but we're sending more photons. We're increasing the intensity and that's not making more photo current. How could that be, right? How could these photons have the frequency required to free electrons? And then we send more of them and it doesn't free more electrons. So D is fine because they're saying, well, it doesn't matter. The photons don't have the energy to free electrons. C is not fine. They're somehow saying, yep, we're freeing electrons, but when more of us go, we can't free any more electrons. That doesn't make any sense, right? If the medicine ball I'm throwing at my students can knock them over, then throwing more of them is gonna knock more students over. Right, photo current should be increasing. Makes no sense. Okay, so in a student investigation, a photo cathode that has a work function of 1.9 electron volts releases electrons when it's exposed to yellow light with that frequency. The students measure and record the stopping voltage and photo current. Okay, cool. In a second trial with the same photo cathode, the yellow light is replaced with a low intensity blue light. Ooh, okay, right away I'm gonna write down what that means. So the yellow light is replaced with a low intensity blue light. Low intensity. So what am I doing to the intensity? I'm decreasing the intensity. I'm also replacing yellow with blue though. So I'm increasing the frequency or I'm lowering the wavelength and the voltage and resulting photo current are measured and recorded. Okay, cool. In a third trial with the same photo cathode, now the low intensity blue light is replaced with a high intensity green light. Okay. So high intensity now in trial three compared to trial two anyway, now I increase the intensity, but I go from blue to green, Roy G Biv. Okay, G is lower frequency than B, Biv. So I'm actually lowering the frequency in trial three. Okay, let's just see what the question's asking. Compared to the results for the low intensity blue light, the photoelectrons emitted because of the high intensity green light require. So what does increasing the frequency actually increase in the electrons? Does it change the number of them emitted or does it change their kinetic energy? Right, it increases their kinetic energy. You could, if you want, start here, right? If you want, start there. Say, okay, increasing the frequency will increase the kinetic energy or the stopping voltage, okay? But again, you could just think, okay, I'm changing here from cotton balls to medicine balls, from five cotton balls to five medicine balls, right? I'm not going to knock over more students, but if I do knock them over, they're going to have more kinetic energy, right? That's the idea behind the frequency here. Okay, so that would, yes, of course, increase the stopping voltage, right? If the electrons have a bigger kinetic energy from that equation as well, the stopping voltage gets bigger. Whoops, <laughs> except I did read this wrong the whole time. I'm talking about the one where I go from blue to green. So like I said, careful, okay, the frequency, everything I said is valid, but it's the other way around. Frequency is getting decreased. Stopping voltage therefore gets decreased or the frequency gets decreased. Why does the stopping voltage get decreased? Because the kinetic energy also gets decreased, right? Okay, so C or D. Now, will it produce a larger or smaller photo current? So by increasing the intensity, remember that means I'm, yet yeah, double check this time, I am increasing the intensity. That essentially means I'm sending more photons. If the photons are capable of removing an electron, then more electrons are gonna get removed because I'm sending more. So by increasing the intensity, I'm going to get a larger photo current. Okay, based on the results of the student's investigation, the maximum stopping voltage measured by the students when the photocathode is exposed to yellow light is blank. So 
start with, we need to find the stopping voltage, right? So the energy in is equal to EK max plus the work function, whatever energy was wasted just freeing the electron. We are given the frequency, so I will use that version of Planck's equation. EK max again, the energy required to stop it is the same as the max kinetic energy of the electrons plus the work function, and we were just given the work function. So moving some stuff around, okay, and let's plug in. I'm gonna go ahead and just convert this to uh, joules, hopefully you're okay with that. And what I got for the stopping voltage is 0 0.242 volts. So to put that in A point B, C times 10 to the power of negative D, that's 2.42 times 10 to the, how many times we move the decimal? Once, right? So don't put in the negative for D, okay? Your answer is 2421, that they already put the negative in for you. All right, in a photoelectric experiment, the current in the apparatus and the kinetic energy of emitted electrons are measured and recorded every 20 seconds over a four minute time span. The properties into the light changed at about 80 seconds and three minutes. 80 seconds and three minutes is 180 seconds, okay? The observations are here. So what are they gonna ask us about these observations? So the change to the incident light at 80 seconds was likely, was it a decrease or an increase in wavelength? So what's it really getting at? If it's an increase in wavelength, right? Essentially, what's this part asking before we even jump in? If it's an increase in wavelength, that would equal a decrease in energy, right? because they are inversely proportional. But if it's a decrease in wavelength, we're saying it's an increase in energy. So what effect does that have on the photons coming in? Well, they either have enough energy or they don't. Remember, right, to knock out an electron. It just means if it does knock one out, it's going that one that it knocks out is gonna have a higher kinetic energy, okay? So essentially, we're trying to see what happens to the kinetic energy. We don't care about the current, okay? So current, first of all, so I guess kind of by process of elimination here anyway, right? We don't care about the current because it didn't change much, but looking here, the kinetic energy fives, fives, suddenly nines and eights, okay? So the kinetic energy jumped up. So what do you think? Did the photon come in with more energy or less energy? It must have come in with more energy, right? If there's more leftover energy to go to the kinetic energy of the electron, that photon must have more to begin with. If it had more energy, what did we say? It must have a smaller wavelength, right? Small spazzy wavelength versus chilled out wavelength. So it had a decrease in a wavelength, okay? Now at uh, three minutes, did it have a decrease in intensity or an increase in intensity? Remember, intensity essentially means how many photons you're shooting at it. So if those photons can free electrons, then sending more will free more electrons, right? Sending less will free less electrons, which means if you're freeing more electrons, your current is gonna go up. If you're freeing fewer electrons, your current's gonna go down. What did we see? We saw it go from the twos to the ones. So the current went down, fewer electrons are being freed, fewer photons are being sent. That is a decrease in intensity and a decrease in wavelength. So it's not there, but the answer is A. Notice this is flagged as a standard of excellence question. So this is literally designed by the government of Alberta for 20% of students to get right. Okay, a group of students produced the following observations relating to the photoelectric effect for light that is incident on a surface. Which of them are correct? So if light has a frequency less than the threshold frequency for that surface, then it will not result in the emission of photoelectrons from the surface, regardless of the intensity of the light. That all sounds good to me, right? That's why this was weird. This was why we started to say, what's going on? Because classical theory said that should work, but we know now that it's not, right? Einstein got on that problem. For light that has a frequency higher than the threshold frequency, okay, so I'm thinking this will emit electrons, let's see where this goes. For that surface, a more intense light produces more photoelectrons than a less intense light. Well, yeah, if those photons are gonna free electrons, then sending more will free more electrons. So that's good, sweet, cool, okay? The intensity of the light has no effect on the kinetic energy of any photoelectrons that are emitted by the surface. So remember, the photons come in, they free an electron, that's it, it happens or it doesn't. Sending more won't change how fast they go, right? If they have the same energy going in, then more of them isn't gonna change the kinetic energy of the electrons. To do that, you'd have to send them in with more energy to begin with, right? You need to send them in with a higher frequency. So 
that's true. That works. The effect of intensity has no effect on kinetic energy. Remember, that's what we thought would happen back in classical physics. And we clearly were seeing it not happen. And we started to realize, oh boy, something's really different about our universe than we thought. So all three of those are true. Four photoelectric effect predictions. And we need to sort these into whether they are what classical wave theory predicted or what quantum physics predicts. So low intensity electromagnetic radiation that is incident on a photoelectric surface for a long time will cause photoemission. Okay, well, that's saying that waves can, can, can transfer energy continuously. They can just build up and build up and build up and then let an electron go. That is what we thought, that's what we predicted. Remember, we didn't see that, right? That was classical wave theory, okay? It was acting like a particle. It either did it or it didn't. It couldn't build up. Okay, high intensity electromagnetic radiation will not cause photoemission unless its frequency is greater than the photoelectric surface's threshold frequency. Yes, that is quantum, right? It either happens or it doesn't. Particle-like behavior. The medicine ball either knocks you over or it doesn't. It can't build up to knocking you over. Okay, the energy of the emitted photoelectrons will increase if the intensity of the incident electromagnetic radiation is increased. Ah, that's classical thinking, right? Keep giving it more energy. Oh, the electrons will go faster and faster. It's just continuous. No, it's not continuous. It's quantized. It's all or nothing, right? We thought it was that. Turned out we were wrong. The energy of the emitted photoelectrons is independent of the intensity of the incident electromagnetic radiation. So when the electrons do get kicked out, does it matter how many photons you're sending? It did back in classical wave theory when we thought they weren't photons, they were waves, right? It does, no, it does not matter in quantum physics because they either kick them out or they don't. It doesn't matter for each one-to-one -one interaction of a photon to an electron. It doesn't care how many other photons are coming in with it. That's the only way to explain that the energy of the emitted photoelectrons is independent of the intensity. Okay, so that wraps up the examples for the photoelectric effect topic. If you're looking for practice with that stuff, uh, check out the Google Classroom or the agenda for the formative work that goes with this topic.